This will be the best season of Super Rugby since 2019, and here's why. While it's not perfect, Super Rugby finally has a steady competition structure moving forward. From the very first round, there'll be Aussie teams versus Kiwi teams, leaving plenty of reasons for disengaged fans to jump back on board. This comes as a huge relief for the rugby faithful, with the competition on the brink of collapse only a few years ago. Now, Super Rugby fans are used to seeing law trials make the game more interesting, and Wild Rugby's finally hopped on board, implementing some of their own law changes and directives that will be in full effect in Super Rugby. In a nutshell, 90 second shot clocks for conversion kicks, 60 seconds for penalty kicks, 30 seconds for scrums and lineouts, yes, the lineout huddle is gone, and 5 seconds to clear the ball from the ruck. What's exciting about this is if you've watched the Six Nations, you'll know that the ball in play time has dramatically increased with these law changes. Yes, more rugby for everyone and more gaps across the field. Also, deliberate knock-ons are back to common sense rulings. If it's a fair crack at the ball, it's just a knock-on. And those pesky 20 minute water breaks are removed. Even though it's a World Cup year and you wouldn't expect too many law variations to come into play for the players sake, Super Rugby's all in and I'm all for it. The 10 minute golden point will continue. And who can forget, this is how Moana Pacifica got their first win in Super Rugby. My personal favourite variation is the halfback must stay on their side of the scrum. Finally, no more sloppy, crappy passes from halfbacks on the pressure, which ruins every practice set-piece move. They'll let the ball sing and backs making decisions in defence will be so important. It'll also give more space for a number 8 to make something happen from the back of the scrum. With that said, the halfback can still retire to behind the number 8's foot, or back to the defensive line. Either way, expect some cool set-piece tries and creativity this season. Okay, one of the more confusing changes, the card system. I haven't seen anyone give full, clear details, but I've done a bit of digging to try and help all of us out. Okay, the on-field referee can give a yellow or a red card. That's it. If the on-field referee gives a player a red card, that player's off for the entire game and they will not be replaced. But when players receive a yellow card, the TMO can upgrade this to a red card. Now that's called a sanctioned red card. The sanctioned red card will remove the player for the rest of the game, but allows a substitute to come on after 20 minutes. So no, there won't be two different types of red cards in the referee's pockets, which was what was confusing so many of us when we first heard about this change. Now on-field referees are specifically looking for intentional or deliberate dangerous foul play to give a red card. Any decisions that are accidental or have significant mitigating circumstances like falling into a tackle will likely result in just a yellow card which will be upgraded to a sanctioned red card depending on the contact and danger to the player. The TMO has eight minutes to make this decision. He then will communicate this to the match officials who will inform the captains of both teams to make necessary adjustments. I can only assume that there'll be some kind of noise and graphic that comes up on the big screen at stadiums to let everyone in attendance know that's the ruling. And finally, I'm sure we'll see this maybe once this season, two yellow cards is an automatic 20 minute sanctioned red card. Besides the referee and law business, the fact it is a World Cup year makes Super Rugby much more entertaining than the years in between, as international players return pushing for World Cup selection to finish their career. Notable players that will be returning to the competition include Patrick Tuipolotu, Damian McKenzie, Milani Nanai, Jack De Brasini, Sam Talakai, Monty Iwani, Tolu Latu and Nemani Nandolo. Throw on top of this the stack of players that are under immense pressure heading into the tournament with All Blacks and Wallabies jerseys up for grabs. Will we see big seasons from Sam Kane, Dane Coles, Asafo Amua? Who will put their best foot forward for the All Blacks starting 12 jersey? Jordy Barrett, Roger Tuavasa Shek, David Harvilli, Quinn Tupaya? And how about the Wallabies? Who's going to earn the starting 10 jersey? Quade Cooper, Bernard Foley, James O'Connor, Noah Lolasio, Ben Donaldson? It's anyone's game. Teams will be playing games in Fiji and Samoa. I mean, how good is that for Pacific Island rugby? Fiji will actually have six home games. The money this will generate can only be a good thing. They're looking to have players mic'd up during the game and it's been confirmed players will be interviewed as soon as they're subbed off to bring fans a closer experience to what the players are feeling. The New South Wales Waratahs will play at a brand new Allianz Stadium starting round one. I don't know why, but there was something about the turf at the old Allianz Stadium that led to so many knock-ons and injuries. In round two, it'll be Super Round. All 12 teams will play over three days at Amy Park, copying NRL's Magic Round. The Brumbies and Highlanders have new head coaches. It'll be a 15 week regular season. It's important to know every team will get one bye at some point in round seven, eight or nine. Each team will verse each other once with the second game against a rival team, which I've put on the screen. Crusaders are the favorites to win the competition with the Blues the most likely to join them. I'll make a video on a structure that could actually fix Super Rugby moving forward, but plenty to be excited about at present.
And the chairman for the Highlanders, Peter Keane, announced there's a World Club Championship set for 2025. Wowee.